I was trying to think about what 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 could I say today? I mean, Richard has the has the real experience, um, and I reflected back on my own career, and when I started working in broadcasting, uh, there were no gay or lesbian people. Um, it's, there weren't. There was an occasional whisper, um, or or a hint, or something like that. But clearly, uh, nobody knew anybody who was gay, nobody had met anybody who was gay, and nobody was related to anybody who was gay. So, slowly, 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 from there, from that position, to the legislation that's going through uh, at the moment, there was quite an amazing transition. And I, I was involved a, a little bit as a, as a tangent, so to speak, as an observer and as a listener to a lot of the things that happened along the way. Because at a certain point, it emerged that maybe there were gay and lesbian people in Ireland. And then people started talking about, not to, gay and lesbian people. And it seemed to me at the time quite remarkable uh, in talking about human beings. The permission that people took upon themselves to speak in the most unspeakable, prurient, nasty, horrible fashion about our fellow human beings. I remember one, I don't want to particularly repeat anything, but I remember actually gasping at something somebody said about uh, gay men in particular uh, on a late, late show one night. So slowly now it had emerged that maybe we did have gay and lesbian members of our community, uh, but clearly uh, they were to be despised. Now, not everybody said that, but there was a tolerance of a kind of speaking um, that, thanks be to God, uh, would be unimaginable, not to say illegal, uh, nowadays. And then I remember David Norris kind of, as it were, emerging, and um, he certainly <coughs> did it in his own particular way. And I remember going down to the Hirschfield Centre, uh, myself, my husband and a group, raising money for David Norris's uh, court case. So that was a slight move because now there were people down there who were gay, there were people who were straight, and you know what? Nobody ate or bit anybody or did anything inappropriate and friends were made and matters uh, progressed. But throughout all of that, there were a couple of other things that happened and I don't know if I have the sequence right, but HIV AIDS emerged and Brian was reminding me about it yesterday. And kind of oh, it ties in partially to some things that I'm involved in at the moment as well. In a part of the world where HIV AIDS still has an appalling stigma. And I do remember the terror, the fear, the ignorance, which was genuine ignorance. I'm not blaming people for, for being ignorant at that time. And I remember people losing partners and friends where family certainly didn't know people were gay. Family certainly wouldn't accept that any member of their family had HIV or AIDS because they were gay. So there was the double whammy of two secrets and two shames rather than the possibility of the kind of future as portrayed through this leaflet. And in its own way, it's a wonder that it has taken this time to come but I don't want to talk for too long, but I remember doing an interview with two lesbians who lived up in Donnybrook. And the cloak and dagger that went on in order to set up that interview. And they were absolutely petrified of the consequences of doing it. And they were very brave to do it. And there was long discussions about changing their voices and changing their... Uh, what their work was and changing where they lived and they were in rented accommodation and they had told the landlord that they were in fact cousins and there were all these complicated situations set up to conceal the truth of what was clearly a very loving 
and a very lasting relationship. And to the best of my knowledge, they're as happy as larks today. And thanks be to God, uh, all of that secrecy is gone. But when we broadcast it, it was like we had done an interview with old Nick himself. <laughs> and, you know, read off the altar. Mind you, it's always very good professionally to be read off the altar. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't, really, I shouldn't put that down as, as a negative. But, I mean, letters to RT get us off the air, affecting the morals of young people of Ireland, and on and on and on. And then I remember things were moving on a tiny little bit, and then we did a full discussion programme live with two gay couples, male and female. And again, like the sky stayed up there, the sun didn't come down. But it's amazing now to look back and think how unbelievably groundbreaking that was considered at the time. So things have changed, thanks be to goodness. But that doesn't mean that they're sorted. And I just want to tell you, I mean, Richard has spoken about the man who wrote the letter to him. But I had two friends, I still have one of them, um, and one of them died about five years ago. And it was a very long, slow death. And the other man was a priest. And while I wouldn't dream of asking anybody about these things, he said to me, he said, I have never broken my vows, so I have to presume that it was a celibate relationship. And this priest was living in absolute terror of anybody senior to him finding out that he was gay because he didn't know the consequences of it, and he still doesn't know the consequences of it. And he made the point to me recently that with all this cover-up that was going on about paedophilia, he said, you know, they did the covering up, my colleagues let me down, but he said, I have to go out there and tow the party line, and I have to take whatever abuse is thrown at me, and I also run the risk that anybody can make an accusation against me, and I live with it as a constant fear. Now, I think that's absolutely appalling. I really, really do. And I hope that the churches get their act together uh, on that um, too. Now, Richard spoke so movingly on the programme. He was absolutely brilliant and I knew he was very nervous because he stupidly doesn't realise how good a speaker he is. Uh, but he moved the country. And I, ha I have a terrible habit of kind of, I'm like a tap. The, the, tears come down. Anyway, we managed to get through it. Uh, but I heard from many other people that they sat in their cars and were so moved and, and wept at the beauty of this relationship. And I think it is indeed wonderful that everything went so well for Richard at such a dreadful time. But what is appalling is that it was because he was lucky. It wasn't by right and it has to be by right. And I hope that when this legislation goes through, that it will be by right. And that in terms of family, and in terms of public institutions, and in terms of public recognition of a deep love, that it will be enshrined in law, <clears throat> because that's where it matters. And Maura Gagan Quinn, in fairness to her, I have to say, and she took a fair bit of, of, of heat at the time, did the right thing and I think that she should be acknowledged for it and I think this is very important but somebody was saying to me uh, I question rose about you know with the church at the moment and and you know the schools and whether or not there should be separation but apparently there still exists the possibility that if it hadn't been St James if it had been another uh, hospital, say, for example, uh, run by the religious or where the religious, I don't know what the technical term is, ownership or moral authority or moral authority or whatever, <clears throat> that there is the possibility still that a hospital could refuse to recognise a person's partner. So the work ain't all done yet, but we have come one heck of a long way from when there were no gay or lesbian people in Ireland and I'm very very glad that the hospice has moved it one step further on and congratulations to all who are involved in it and congratulations to Glenn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>